Good evening. Thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Schuster. I am the chair of the MIT Innovation or Enterprise Forum Northwest this year. And uh, let me welcome you to our program tonight, uh, the e-infrastructure using the 21st century data network to secure our physical infrastructure. I think this is a particularly interesting topic given the security threats we've seen ramp up over the past several years and uh, the shaky ground we seem to be on at times with uh, certain foreign actors. Uh, and I think this is a, the exact type of event that we like to do because it's very future facing, but it's extremely relevant to you know, what's happening and the issues that we're, we're, we're dealing with right now. So just to give you a little background on the group, uh, the MIT Enterprise Forum is a global organization uh, of dedicated professionals with 25 local chapters affiliated with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology through their MIT Technology Review magazine, or media arm. Uh, what we do, our mission is to inform, connect, and coach technology entrepreneurs uh, and enable them to rapidly transform ideas into world-changing companies. Uh, we are a volunteer-run organization, and uh, we want as many people to get involved as possible. So to just uh, kind of cover some of the, uh, the upcoming events that we've got, uh, the next one is going to be in October. Um, and it's going to be, uh, re it's going to be startup focused, entrepreneur focused. It's, it's about finding the resources around town that you might not know about uh, for launching your startup. We have a, a feature innovation forum event on November 15th called uh, Solving the Future Challenges of Population Growth. And the, uh, the next one's going to be on January 17th, which is blockchain and its promising future beyond cryptocurrency. So um, just to talk about some of the volunteers that uh, helped with this particular event, I wanted to thank uh, Jaime Mendez, the team lead, Eric Mulver, the uh, team MVP right here, uh, Heather Lewis, our moderator, Chad Oda, Greta Knappenberger, Paul Meehan, and Jimmy Gia. Everybody was very critical in, uh, in helping bring this together. Um, if you like the event, we, are, uh, we do have a membership program. It's $50 per year. Uh, it includes uh, ten, discounted $10 tickets to our events and, uh, and other membership perks. So if you are curious about that, please see me or Cindy at the front desk. And uh, in addition to our volunteers, I also wanted to thank our sponsors because they're very critical in, uh, in, in helping our programs come together. Uh, so, Artifact Group is our Ruby sponsor for the season, and uh, they are very supportive. I wanted to thank them. iSoft Stone has been immensely helpful as our media sponsor, helping us uh, get all of our marketing uh, really going. Uh, Stokes Lawrence, Freelock Computing, MIT Club of Puget Sound, these are our in-kind sponsors. And I wanted to thank Seattle University for the space tonight for hosting us. Thank you. Um, without further delay, I wanted to hand it over to Heather Lewis, who, among other things, is a council member for the UW's Pacific Northwest Cybersecurity Business Leadership Council and a vice chair of the City of Seattle Community Technology Advisory Board. Wow, and that's just two of the four things that you've got going on, through four or more many things that you've got going on. So I'm really happy that Heather's here to moderate the event and kind of guide the discussion, and uh, I'll turn it over to her now. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's wonderful to see you. And thank you, Adam, for the very thoughtful introduction. Tonight on the agenda, we will hear from three speakers, Mike Simon, Frank Height, and David Hobbs. First up will be Frank Height. This will be preceded by a, excuse me, uh, panel discussion. We'll have some planned questions up front, and then we'll ask audience members to come to this microphone so that you can be in the live stream. Here we are. We have Frank Height. He is the CEO of Leviathan Security. And his background, he has a, he's a recognized expert in the fields of information assurance, network security, and systems penetration. He's previously worked for the Department of Defense Civilian Information Security, 
He, was, he worked as, excuse me, a Department of Defense Civilian Information Security Officer, and he served as a visiting lecturer at the United States Army War College, the United States Navy War College, and the Naval Postgraduate School on the subject of defensive information warfare and military computer system security. So he is extremely qualified, and we look forward to hearing from him. Please welcome Frank Height. Hi, thank you. Uh, I was actually here in this very building eight years ago this week, which is funny. It's just kind of a strange coincidence. Uh, and I'm a product of a Jesuit education. I survived one year at a Jesuit high school uh, until Wall Street beckoned and they were paying young people a lot of money to do computers. So the title of this talk is interesting. It's Commerce in the Face of Capable Adversaries. And um, there's you know, kind of a, a concept that we should really think about. What, what is a capable adversary? What do they want to do? What, do they want, what are their, their goals, their, prop, you know, their, their capabilities? How do they achieve them? This is normally a TED Talk, so you normally get the, the click time through. I got to get this done in 18 minutes. So there are certain axioms, right? So I mean, an adversary is a human. It's a person, it's an actor. It's not a bot, it's not a zombie, it's not some lore. This is an adversary, a real thinking, malicious actor out to get your enterprise, you, your information, etc. And I mean capable with groups that have cutting edge capabilities. These are people who know their stuff, they make their own tools. They're not script kiddies, if you've heard that word. Script kiddie is someone who just uses other people's tools. These are tool smiths. Capable adversaries write their own tools. They improve their own tools. Commerce is just what it sounds like, right? Commerce on the internet, this is doing business on the internet in the face of a capable, malicious adversary. That's the end of the axioms for this, right? So the premise on this is that adversaries innovate and they build on the past. They do this faster than your defenses innovate, which is critical. They use the very tools of modernity to propagate new techniques, improve on existing techniques. They do this at appalling speed. And you're not quite toast, but you are absolutely beginning to brown. Like if you think that your enterprise or your business or your place is airtight or secure, the odds are seriously in favor of you being very, very wrong about that. So those are my axioms and premises. A capable adversary has got a couple of goals. They have a monetization goal and an intelligence goal. The first one's monetization, and that's interesting. I'm going to give you a history lesson. So in 1997, there was a group right here in Seattle called the Trench Code Gang. Anybody old enough to remember this? That broke. Well, here's one of them and here's the other. This is the Trench Code Gang. These guys broke into Seafirst Bank in Tacoma and literally walked out with 355 pounds of cash. They had to use big duffel bags. This was the largest bank robbery in United States history at the time. These guys literally stole 355 pounds of cash. It's nothing. The biggest bank robbery in history is peanuts. Right? About this. Has anybody seen any of these pictures? Does any of this look familiar? Love that little victory dance. Mm -hmm. Little victory dance. They call these people cashers, right? This is part of a gang that printed out payment cards for a, a bank in Scotland called the Royal Bank of Scotland. Very imaginative. I actually don't know where, something's up with this presentation, but it, it's all good. Um, I need the mic here. These guys broke into the Royal Bank of Scotland using a SQL injection attack, a very simple web-based attack. They lived on their banking system for six months and became very, very good at how RBS WorldPay actually made these payment cards. This is what you'd get in lieu of a paycheck in some places. 
So what they did was they physically printed these cards. They sent them to all time zones across the globe and in a 24 hour period stole $9.22 million. That's a half a ton of cash, right? That's real money at this point. It should be noted that Royal Bank of Scotland's interbank transfer for a 24 hour period was $10 million. That was their hard limit. This group got them to a 92% limit. They got 92% of all the money that RBS WorldPay had at that disposal in that 24-hour period. They did it by printing up these physical cards from Tokyo to Moscow and in a coordinated effort emptied ATM machines across the globe. That's how much cash. That is decidedly not peanuts, right? So everything old is new again. We're in a history lesson here. Everybody knows what this is. Has anybody ever received a letter that sounds even remotely like this? It kind of has a kind of haunting familiarity. This was written in 1827. It is. The Spanish prisoner is my absolute favorite. This is the exact same scam as I'm stuck in London Someone stole my wallet, and I need you to wire me some cash. This was 1910. Even the grammar is like, you know. 1981, this is where we start monetizing for real. Telex, facsimile machines. This is just great, right? This is a comment from 1992. It's a real shotgun approach. They send out all sorts of letters. They see who bites. Let this one sink in. $200 million in fax scams. These guys innovate. $200 million is peanuts. Now we have the information age, for real. I don't know if anybody knows what, if anyone knows this, they get a beer on me tonight of their choice. It's the Nigerian Criminal Code. Section 419 of the Nigerian Criminal Code. So does everybody remember the City Never Sleeps, Citibank's logo, uh, their motto, the City Never Sleeps? It actually turns out that the Ethiopian <laughs> branch periodically napped. So this is Amos. Amos took Citibank for $27 million. And he did it in the most audacious way you can possibly imagine. He simply changed the appearance of his phone number on his cell phone and Citibank used that as the authentication method to make 24 wire tra transfers totaling $27 million. $27 million. That is decidedly not peanuts. In 1997, I've been doing this for a long time. I've had a job in information security probably since 1993. In 1997, I worked uh, at a military facility and something called eligible receiver 97, came out. anybody from the military here? If I tell you more about this, I get to go to jail. This is actually called National Intelligence Exercise Eligible Receiver 97, it's classified. What they wanted to do was see if the people at Fort Meade using publicly available, I have no idea what reprint classics means, this is not part of my presentation, um, using open source research, publicly available tools, if they could break into United States military facilities. The rate of success was so appalling that government action ensued. Um, you know what, if you Google eligible receiver, you can find out more than I can tell you. And I actually said, yeah, this is becoming an increasingly more important topic. So in 2003, something happened that is important to this audience. Everything that I've said up to this point has been leading up to this slide in 2003. Um, a creature escaped the lab in China. Somebody was doing some cyber research in China and their research got out. The subtitle of this is that. So if anybody remembers the summer of 2003 in August, they'll remember that on August 11th, 
there was something called Blaster. Anybody remembers Blaster? It made your computer reboot. It was really, really annoying. It was what they called a flash worm. It was a very fast propagating worm. Does anybody remember what happened on August 14th of 2003? I'm going to give you a conversation between these two guys, Don and Jerry. Don works at a place called Miso, and Jerry works at a place called Ohio Energy. I'm going to read this out loud. They say never read the slides, but I'm going to read this aloud because it makes me feel warm inside. <laughs> this is, by the way, this is from the congressional record. None of this is my opinion. I wonder what's going on here. Something strange is happening. Ellipses. Jerry. Jerry's at, Jerry, Don is at MISO. Jerry is at Ohio Energy. We have no idea what happened. You guys have anything going on? Now, I called you guys a bit ago to find out what was going on because I saw, I love this, we have no clue. Our computer is giving us fits too. We don't know the status of some of the stuff around us. Time passes. Miso, this is, this is Don again. I called you guys like 10 minutes ago and I thought you were fight, figuring out what was going on there. Well, we're trying to. Our computer is not happy. It's not cooperating either. That was the blackout of 2003. So, on August 12th at 2 o'clock in the morning, I was at Redmond. I was at Microsoft figuring out how to fix Blaster. And I've seen packet traces that show First Ohio is propagating this freaking attack like mad. People say there's never been a successful cyber attack against national energy infrastructure. That is demonstrably false. Now, there's proximate cause and there's cause in fact. So if you got lawyers in the room, they're going to argue all day about the proximate cause of the blackout and the cause in fact of the blackout. So what was the cause in fact? A branch fell on a wire. The wire shorted, which made the problem of distributing load bad. But see, there was no alarm system to tell people what happened. And without an alarm system, other things tripped. And then those other things tripped, and now you have self-organizing criticality, and you have what's called a cascading failure. So if this sounds like, for want of a horseshoe, the kingdom was lost, I, it's close. But that's a fable, and this really happened. So let that sink in. 2009, Lockheed learns a lesson. <laughs> what Lockheed said, let that wash over you. 2009, what the Wall Street Journal reported. The Joint Strike Fighter was a, is a boondoggle defense contract that is going to wind up costing this country a trillion dollars. Terabytes of data were stolen by the People's Liberation Army to such a degree that they actually finished their copy of the F-35, the J-31, before the F-35 is actually in full production. When the three, oh, this, it just gets better, it gets better. They were owned for years, right? When the J-31 program became into full production swing in China, Lockheed and other members of the Defense Department and the Pentagon went to Congress and said, we need to counter the, the J-31 threat. Can anyone imagine what countering the J-31 threat looks like? It looks like buying more F-35s. Now, if that's not a perverse security incentive, like, I have no idea what is. This is kind of killer, right? The fact that Lockheed is unable to really judge what the PLA stole is a nightmare scenario. Given all that, uh, now Lockheed has got the cyber kill chain and companies like Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon are cashing in massively on defense contracting money to protect our national defense information, which they've proven demonstrably for years to be unable to protect. So, 
solutions. I don't have any solutions. This is literally the end of my presentation. Would you like to know the secret twist of this presentation? Eight years ago this week, I gave this exact presentation in this very building. <laughs> I gave this exact presentation in this building eight years ago. Um, I'm supposed to give a bold call to action and make you all feel better. <laughs> I have nothing. Um, there are many, many things that people can do individually, organizationally. Uh, overcoming these things is going to be very, very difficult. Um, there are speakers that are going to have more, aren't going to be way less bleak than I was. I, this is, I feel like I almost cheated you, right, by doing this. But I hope, I hope this is more of a powerful message than anything I could possibly have otherwise said, right? None of this is better, right? We now have something called Dragonfly. Dragonfly is a penetration of power generation equipment and transmission facilities across the United States beginning in 2011. That's really bad. Um, the idea that a foreign adversary, a foreign intelligence service has beachhead access to power generation facilities and power transmission facilities across the United States is a national security threat of monumental proportions. Um, the fact that it has provably been ongoing since 2011, which is fully six years, is uh, a nightmare. Uh, I don't particularly know how to fix this. I can tell you that security is a mindset, that you, we've got to start thinking about security holistically, as a mindset, we have to dispense with the learned helplessness that this unrelenting litany of one attack, one breach after another has, has taught us. It has to be kind of culture. You don't have to be paranoid, but you have to be careful, right? You can have a secure culture in your organizations. You can ensure that your computers are patched. You can ensure that your perimeters are at least well-defined and understood. You can periodically review logs. It has to be somewhat systematic uh, and, and systemic. I mean, I mean both, right? I would say that um, if you're doing something critically important, like supplying the energy needs of several million people packed in close proximity, your job is important and that you should take it very, very seriously because in the blackout of 2003, people did die. People who lost ventilators and people who lost power where they critically needed it died. So if anybody ever says no one ever died from an attack, a hack attack, they're, they're actually wrong about that. Those are the three kind of solutions. This is who I am. Uh, I am sorry that I am this bleak. And uh, I'm looking forward to taking your questions on. Thank you, Frank, for sharing your insights. Next up, we have Mike Simon. He has over 20 years of experience in risk management for large enterprise accounts. He designs and implements one of the largest and most visible security installations in the world. And his, he, excuse me, can't speak tonight. He uh, has experience working with healthcare, biotech, legal, financial institutions, public utilities, and e-commerce. We look forward to hearing from Mike. I'm going to have to adjust a little bit here. Well, um, I really hate presenting after somebody that's this good. <laughs> That was astounding, and the eight-year span of no difference is shocking. Um, before I jump into some of the slides I prepared, I want to back up one of, your, one, of your, one of the statements you made, which is everybody likes to say we've never had a successful attack against U.S. infrastructure. You mentioned a worm. Um, does anybody remember SQL Slammer? 
A couple of things I love as a computer scientist, a couple of things I love about SQL Slammer. One is, and this isn't all that widely known, um, but it wasn't exactly a secret, SQL Slammer fit into a single packet. One UDP packet, so you didn't have to do a whole handshake, nothing interesting, you just sent it, and if you were infectable, you were infected, and it took over and used you to infect the rest of the world. Does anybody remember how long that took? 20, 22 minutes for the world. Can I just blow your mind? Go. David, the children I wrote that paper in my guest house. That's, it, 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 was, it was an amazing event. Yeah. Now, what isn't all that well reported, everybody knows where Bellevue, Washington is, it's not far from here, their 911 system went down because of this. Talk about potential deaths. If your 911 system isn't working, that is incredibly dangerous. Right. So the, the scope of what we're talking about, and, and in fact this does lead into what I was asked to talk about a little bit today, which is this physical and cyber convergence and or whether or not they are converging. Um, raise your hand if you have any involvement with physical security. Locks, doors, all right. Um, the rest of you probably have some level of involvement with, with digital security. Um, they're the same thing. They are not different and I'm gonna prove that to you today. Um, the reason is it's computers. There is no physical security system out there at this point that at some level it, uh, doesn't involve a computer system. Um, I certainly have a lot of padlocks around that are not computer based, but at the enterprise level, it's computers all the way down. Plus, I just couldn't resist using a cute picture of turtles. <laughs> so part of my goal today is to just put a lie to this idea that there is a debate about this. They're not different or separate. They are the same, and if you try to t treat them as separate and different, you will fail and lose. And in the case of physical security, the results of that are potentially fairly catastrophic. So it's already happened. It didn't happen by design. As a society, we don't design things and then build them generally. We build things and then decide that was a design. And interestingly enough, we should be able to fix that at some level in some way. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of computers. This was actually literally the first computer I ever programmed. The way you program this computer to boot, actually, is you flip each of those individual switches. Each of those represents one bit and then you dump that 16 bits into memory and you've got a whole word of, of programming done. And when I say word, I mean 16 bits. After about an hour and a half of doing that, you're ready to boot it. Clearly a computer, this is what everybody thinks of when they think ancient computer. Um, also a computer, somewhat newer, a little higher in capability, and uh, yet another computer that's about 10 million times faster than the first one I showed you. And 10 million times bigger. I mean, that is one large phone, if you look at that. <laughs> what is this? Is that right? <laughs> it's two computers. Perfect answer. There's a computer in the card itself that's being activated actually by EM fields emanating from the thing behind it. Those two are actually having a network conversation about whether or not this card is something we think it is and it's giving up its identity. The back end of the, of the gray box there is yet another bunch of computers. You'll probably recognize this more colloquially as the way you get in and out of doors. In large organizations, hospitals, and so on, they use these devices to actually tell you whether or not the door should unlock. So we recognize this device. That is a deadbolt. It's also a computer input and output device. That's a deadbolt that you can activate um, locally with Bluetooth or via the cloud. This is a deadbolt that you can unlock or lock from wherever you happen to be connected to the internet. 
Uh, no, we've got some power people in here. Can anybody correctly identify? We know this is a switch, a three-phase switch. Anybody correctly identify what kind? It's a recloser. So this is a switch that if you activate, what we're not showing here on this view of it is there's a little box on the right-hand side that it connects to a network, and that network gives you the ability via the network to open and close hundreds of thousands of volts, all at once. If you're a lineman, think about this. You're a lineman, and this is an open circuit. It's dead, you're out there fixing things. How important is it to you that nobody's hacked into the box at the end of this device? It is life and death. We talked about toast earlier. This wouldn't just be browning. Okay, everybody recognizes these. These are computer controlled everywhere except in the United States. Controlled, remember I used the word controlled here. We use computers to monitor, we use computers to figure out what they're up to, we use computers to gather telemetry, all kinds of good stuff. We don't, at this point, use them to control nuclear power systems. Is it because we're just brilliant? After your presentation, I'm betting everybody's saying no to that. <laughs> Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why? Too cheap. Go. Rick, Rickover actually had a huge influence on our civilian um, nuclear systems, actually, and is one of the reasons that our Navy has been incredibly safe. Um, most Navy nuclear power systems use light bulbs to tell you whether, whether things are going on and off. Not, not complicated things like dials. It's mostly about green, red, whether or not it's, it's activated. <laughs> That's part of the reason. The other part of the reason is we did it first. We built all of our systems and quit building them a while back, although we're starting up again, before we could trust computer systems to actually do activation actuation. The rest of the world did it after us, so it's the reverse of the cell phone issue. Our cell phone infrastructure, well, it's actually not the reverse. Our cell phone infrastructure is aging and kind of cruddy compared to the rest of the world because we did it first. And now to get catch up with the rest of the world, we need to actually go reinvest, replace millions of switches, and, and, and do it all again. So, oh, and anybody recognize this? That is a soldier in an army that broke the internet. Just for a little while. Uh, does anybody remember how, how long Mirai took down, like, big chunks of the core of the Internet? It took down for three days, 650 terabyte DDoS attack, 120,000 nodes. I thought you might know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> that is an, an innocuous-looking little physical device that is a DVR, digital video recorder for security purposes. That's making you more secure. That's making the internet a heck of a lot less secure. About three million, and, may, and this, this number may be wrong. This is stuff I pulled out of the F5 Labs stuff. Um, so the original Dyne attack from the MRI botnet was only 120,000 nodes, and it spread until the janitor started doing digital chemotherapy with Bricker bot, which is something that we discovered, which actually goes and destroys the camera permanently. So he destroyed over $100 million worth of equipment, um, permanently destroyed. Bricked it. Uh, so the digital chemotherapy worked, or is, is kind of working still. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was in a presentation Friday where there was a fairly interesting debate about whether or not we like that guy. It's property damage. Yeah, I mean, millions and millions of dollars worth of property damage, but he did sort of save probably trillions of dollars worth of e-commerce e time. And you are going to address actually some of those sorts of, of, of moments later. So in a lot of ways, this this is a second order security effect. The consequence of plopping digital systems into places where they didn't traditionally live in 
physical security plants. Let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. Yeah, these slides didn't all come through exactly like we'd expect, but take my word for it, there was a really cool image beside this, I'm pretty sure. Um, so as digital systems proliferate into places where they're managed by people who are traditional physical security specialists, you don't necessarily get all of the controls that we would expect to see on digital security systems. And what did we just learn about how good we are at digital security controls? We suck. We're terrible at it. But one thing I will claim from, from my side of the fence here, who does a lot of digital security, we're better than the, the people on the physical security side who have never really addressed it. So these things get put into systems where patching and code review and digital perimeter stuff don't necessarily exist. One of the issues with digital perimeter is, in fact, that the physical perimeter for physical devices extends. Uh, anybody here have any sort of background or, or work in power plants? What is the physical security? What's the PSP for a, for the, let's say a distribution system? people that aren't authorized to even get into the, you know, into the control network or allowed to even be there. Exactly. Which is why when, for example, and this occurred for me two months ago, when somebody says, I'm going to put this Bluetooth device inside of this power generation system because I'd like to be able to remotely be able to handle some of those things, I cringe a bit. So. The reverse happens as physical security or physical plant things infiltrate digital security networks. You end up with odd things like, for example, Target. Target is a direct result of them not segregating their network, but the, the impact of the Target breach was a direct result of them not segregating their HVAC systems from point of sale. Because you know, you want those two to, no, you don't want them to talk to each other at all. Um, and that keeps happening. HVAC systems have no business playing on the same network. They need a network. They need their own network. When you put them together, you don't take care of them in the same way. HVAC folks are actually out there. You've got Siemens HVAC folks. I'll just pick on Siemens because they kind of were responsible for some of this. They've got them out there plugging thumb drives into HVAC systems thinking there's no impact to corporate. They're wrong about that. If they're connected, there is an impact. And you can't avoid that and, and keep your uh, ears plugged. So two problems and a cool thing. We'll talk about the cool thing in a bit um, and how thoughtfully converged networks actually allow you to do new, interesting, useful things. So more ancient computing. That's actually my Timex Sinclair that I'm holding there. Anybody else ever have one of those? Awesome machine. Um, the life cycle on that Timex Sinclair is about three years. It went from being kind of fun and cool to a complete piece of trash in around three years. And that's kind of true of most of our digital infrastructure. We put it in place. We hope maybe it'll last five years, and then somebody pushes it to seven years, and that's always wrong. Physical security people are used to a life cycle of 40. How, long, how old do you think the locks on some of the doors in this place are? Not 40, this building isn't 40 years old. Maybe 15, 20? Showing no signs of wear. They're fine. That is the life cycle that those, that is the mindset of physical security people. It should last for freaking ever. Well, here is the Great Wall of China. It's been around for longer than 40 years. And we're actually doing some repairs on it. Now, it kind of failed its function a few hundred years ago, but still there, still capable of doing everything it ever could do. Again, imagine a great image on the left. So these are both reasonable assumptions for the way the world worked a while back. They're not reasonable now. Um, the politically correct thing to say here, and I'm going to follow your and your steps here a bit, the politically correct thing to say here is that we should compromise, meet in the middle, find a new path that works best 
for physical security people and digital security people and, and just kumbaya and be happy about it. And that's just not going to work. As much as we might want to think that we can maintain whatever physical security paradigms we've used, the cyber is big. And it's taking over, and it really does run all the things. So you can't. You can't just say, I'm going to do things the way I used to and ignore all of the cybersecurity stuff that doesn't affect me. It does affect you. Modern security systems increasingly use and utilize commodity computer hardware. By the way, that is actually part of the problem. Um, back when people started building out digital infrastructure for cybersecurity or for physical security, there was a lot of special purpose stuff that wasn't networked or connected or running Windows. And now it's commodity gear. It's cheaper. It's faster. You can go to market faster, much, much, much faster if you just use stuff that's on the shelf. Well, it also means that stuff that's on the shelf has known vulnerabilities, and you're incorporating all of that history and baggage into what you have. Now, I could counter that. I'm not going to because I don't have time with what's going on with IoT, which is generally special purpose hardware that isn't getting patched because why would you do that? Oh, yeah, and by the way, we're really bad. We're bad at the digital stuff. So not doing it is almost an option, but not quite. So without trying to claim which is the farmer and the cowman, um, operating independently uh, is asking to be defeated. Uh, there's a whole left-hand panel here about Rogers and Hammerstein that you can't see. But we do need to be friends. We need to be able to collaborate and cooperate. We need to build infrastructure that actually protects us. And to do that, we work together. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll propose a, a conversation. I won't say that this is one I had about two weeks ago. Physical security person says, I had all these single piece, um, all of these cameras, these 300 cameras on a single piece of coax before, and it wired it up myself. And your fancy digital network should be able to handle all that, right? No problem. I think about 300 cameras at 15 frames per second, MPEG-4, high resolution, say 3 megapixels, and I do some math, and I say, oh my goodness. Those cameras are 3.5 gigabits per second. You're going to make me upgrade, aren't you? And Farmer, oh, there's, I gave it away, um, says, yeah, like I said, no problem. Plug them all. I've already plugged them all in. We're ready to go. It's a fundamental break in how we think of things. They're still in an analog world. A lot of the thoughts that they have are still analog thoughts. They're trying to map those onto a modern space, and it's not working for them. You need to help them. You, if, as you're, if you're in the digital side, need to, to step forward and ask. So finally, the cool thing, and I'll leave you with this. Thoughtful convergence of these two fields is actually quite beneficial. My work at my company actually starts to build these things into a combined whole. So I can do things like tell you who was in the building when this hack happened. At 3 o'clock in the morning when that workstation was com compromised, who was actually physically here without waiting to the next morning so we can talk to the physical security people and have them pull the logs and print it out probably and then say, oh, well, it was this list. You can actually directly correlate. You can start saying things like, why is, why is this person suddenly showing up on a pattern that we didn't expect? Um, you know, we're seeing them show up, we're seeing them log in, we're seeing them move in new ways. I can pretty accurately predict when somebody's about to quit. If I combine just their digital footprint within the organization and their physical movement, it turns out it changes just as they're start, think, starting to think about, hey, I want to I leave, I want to go somewhere else. Um, trivial stuff like Sally's physical movement through the network exceeds the speed of light. 
well, rather than calling the physicists because something really interesting has happened, maybe we should assume that Sally has shared her credentials with somebody else. That only really becomes useful when you have the backing of their physical movements. You know where physically they are at any particular time. You know which one's the real Sally and which one's Sally Prime. Um, again, behavioral analysis of movement, physical break-ins resulted in no physical damage. I wonder if that actually means they did something else while they were broken in, while they actually had physical access to the facility. Did they log in? Believe it or not, that seems like a trivial conversation that you always have, right? Somebody broke in and they didn't seem to steal anything. Let's talk to the guys that run the computer systems. No, it's not typical because it's separate, separate camps fairly often. And so I'll leave you with a couple of suggestions. Don't treat them as physical problems, they're not, or, or separate problems, they're not. And if I can leave you with anything really interesting and useful to do, it's, the, it's bullet item number two. Collect data. Make it accessible and findable. You can't use what you don't collect. Storage is cheap. Storage might as well be free. If you have a system that generates information, log files, NetFlow data, anything like that. My suggestion is to you, find a way of collecting it, indexing it, and being able to search through it. Even if you don't have a, a use or a purpose for it right now, I guarantee you, forensically, you'll want to look at that eventually. And then a, la a last um, bit here, also share, do it now, cross-discipline information, and to support bullet item number two, buy things that generate data. When I look at security devices, when I look at, represented here, Leviathan and Radware, I look at the richness of the data that they can produce, and by the way, these both, both of those devices develop incredibly rich data. And that's a part of my, it's part of how I evaluate whether or not I wanna use these things. If it's spitting out kind of lame little bits about you know, what the firewall decided to do today or or the fact that you've just got a port scan or something like that, that's good and maybe useful. If it's telling me something more interesting that I can use and correlate and parse, I am all for it. And that should be all I have. Thanks. And our last speaker for the evening is David Hobbs, who is an MIT alum. So we're excited to have you, especially for that reason. And of course, a cybersecurity expert with more than 18 years experience in cybersecurity and network engineering. Thanks, David. So good evening, everybody. I'm David Hobbs. I'm an evangelist for Adware, which means I fly around the world. I meet with uh, interesting people. We talk about cybersecurity. Um, I meet with a lot of the uh, computer emergency response teams for world governments, uh, financial institutions, stock exchanges. And uh, this evening, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the economics of cyber attacks. So I'm going to talk about a bit of a historical context. And does hacking pay? We're going to dive into Darknet and take a look at the cyber attack marketplace, right? How do hackers actually do what they do? And then we're going to take a look at the economics of defenses and really take a look at a reality check. So as a professional, you know, what, what does it really mean economically for you to be able to defend yourself against, obviously, from the last two presentations, kind of a scary world? So a little over 100 years ago, they invented a uh, horse's carriage. Let's see, is everything drawing right? That's good. Um, and the horseless carriage was neat, but in order for this idea to take off, you needed a couple things to have happen. So you had to have roads. You had to have the infrastructure to create an assembly line. And so Ford comes out and says, okay, we're going to fix this. We're going to make some roads. We're going to make an assembly line. And then we had the ideal economic conditions. And what this did was it put horses out of the marketplace. 
right? There's still a little bit of horses around today in, in our society, but you know, everybody used to have a horse, and we don't have horses really anymore. You know, I, I don't take my horse downtown to the office any longer, and, and I don't think anybody in this room does either. So cyber attack has kind of reached this economic tipping point. There's, there's really, there's more resources available. There's more targets that are paying out the money. And the level of maturity has driven the efficiency to being able to do this, right? So we've turned a corner economically for cyber attack. So I know that some people take a look at the movies and they have an idea in their head of what a hacker might look like, um, you know, and the reality is that the people sitting around the table talking about an idea with a computer in front of them, those are really kind of what the hackers may look like as opposed to the guy with the hoodie on, you know, the lone wolf, you know, the I'm anonymous member guy, right? If you're going to make money, you have to do it and run it like a business. And that's what people are doing today. So they structure their organizations together and they say, how are we going to execute a plan? Who is going to be the brains behind it? Or how do we collaborate in terms of being able to uh, figure out what are, what are the things that are worth value? How are we going to exfiltrate data? What's it going to be worth? How is the execution going to happen? And how do they essentially come up and, and make money? Right? It's, a, it's a business. And, and that's the thing is that the lone wolf idea isn't really true. So Ponymon says that the average attacker earns approximately a quarter of the salary that an average IT person makes, right? That's taking into account the people that are working in call centers being outsourced in other countries to call and pretend that they're Microsoft or that they're the IRS, saying, you owe me a bunch of money, and if you don't buy me a bunch of Target gift cards right now, the feds are going to come and arrest you, right? We've all had that call. Right? They're the low-paid wage workers, but the people that are actually running the call center, they're the ones that are making the millions. And that's the thing is nobody's trying to actually be average in this marketplace. They want to become above average. So the monetization of what people are doing, right? intellectual property, we look at the Equifax breach the other day, right? and that is the gold mine. That is worth so much money for criminals out there to commit identity theft, take out credit cards in your name, start doing fraud, carding operations, right? It's worth way more than just credit card numbers themselves. In the dark net, they sell credit card numbers for about nine to 10 bucks a piece with high limits on them. But the PII records, the personal identifying information, those could be $75 a piece. And we'll take a look at the marketplaces and how people are selling these records and how they're actually exploiting it to take financial advantage over the companies that may have had a data breach. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, they lost about 400,000 records from Georgia, sold on uh, the Darknet marketplace for about $350,000. That's what that database was worth. That's what it was selling for. Granted, they did this slide when uh, Bitcoin was not worth what it is today. You know, this is a bit of an older slide, so I apologize if I'm not current with the, uh, with the Bitcoin price. Um, another healthcare database gets breached, right? And they sell 210,000 records on Darknet for $175,000. Another healthcare breach, right? And granted, the High Tech Act came into account, uh, I think it went active a few years ago, where basically it could be a $1.5 million fine leveraged against people that are carrying healthcare records. Now, when you take this into consideration, a children's hospital in Dallas, Texas got a $6 million fine. Right? Seattle Children's Hospital, near and dear to all of our hearts, is a charity. Right? It's run by generous benefactors that kind of keep the thing going. It's not a for-profit hospital. So how can a children's hospital get a $6 million fine? Well, they lost a laptop, and they lost a cell phone that had medical records on it. And as an essence, the regulators came in and said, you were negligent, and therefore, you get a $6 million fine. Now, the hackers know this. So now they get a little bargaining power. They say, well, we've got your data. Do you want to pay a bunch of money and we won't rat you out that we took your data? Or do we start selling it around in Darknet and then you're going to get a fine and all the people are going to get their identity compromised? So this is where ransom attacks start to come in. These are the kinds of situations that we work with customers regularly to have to deal with this kind of a situation. So Bitfinex. Uh, 
their exchange, they're uh, in Hong Kong now. They wound up getting a DDoS attack and they go offline, and the exchange or the price of Bitcoin plummets. Somebody broke into them and stole $72 million worth of Bitcoin. Now, that of course can move the marketplace. Same thing with the DDoS that happens to them pretty regularly. Um, and so they wound up offering um, a rant or a recovery reward of about $3.5 million to figure out who stole the money. So there's economics in this. The hackers in the marketplace are saying, hey, this is really super easy. These exchanges, pretty easy to break into. Bitcoin, reasonably anonymous. There's a lot of debate on whether or not it's anonymous currency or not, since most of the transactions are being tracked globally. Then you get into the problem, how do you tumble, how do you money launder, but we'll, we'll talk a little more about that later. This is what the hackers are doing. So over 430 booter and stressor websites have been available for people to go out and actually just go rent. So for as little as $6, people can DDoS people with a five to 10 gigabit DDoS attack, right? This is where compromised cameras living on a botnet are conscripted into a little DDoS botnet. And somebody says, I'm gonna rent the botnet and then I'm gonna attack somebody and then I'm gonna send them an email and say, you either pay a ransom or you're gonna go offline. Now, an interesting story, I was in Korea a couple of months ago and one of the internet service providers wound up getting a ransomware malware that came through, locked up all their servers, and essentially they were faced with the idea that they have to pay a ransom or they're gonna go out of business. The Korean government says, you're not to pay this ransom, it's forbidden. They said, no, no, we're gonna go out of business and we're gonna lose all of our customers, don't you understand? They said, no, it's forbidden. So they negotiated with the people that had all their servers locked up to make three installment payments equaling $1 million. And they paid it. They got their servers back, goes out in the news, so now it's blood in the water all over Asia. Everybody goes, ooh, Korean ISPs paid a million dollars out. Two days later, 64 of the financial institutions start getting emails saying, you either pay $50,000 in ransom or we're coming for you with a botnet army. About a third of them paid. Because they say, if you don't pay the $50,000 up front, tomorrow it's gonna be $75,000. Can you tell the story about the CNC infrastructure? Yeah, so there, there's actually a number of CNC infrastructures running right now. Uh, we installed the Mirai botnet and did the talk um, at Nanog about the insides of the Mirai botnet and, and what, what that means. Essentially, the Mirai botnet conscripted a bunch of cameras and there's a couple of command and control infrastructures out there. Some of them are running on ubiquity wireless antennas because they used UBNT as the username and UBNT as the password. Very hard to guess, right? Ubiquity network, UBNT. Okay, got it, hard password. Those command and control infrastructure essentially are running in a bunch of wireless carriers all over the place and then these cameras can actually reach into the command and control infrastructure and they can get their instructions of who to attack. This is where the DNS water torture attack came from that took down Dyne DNS. It went down for three days, they lost 16,000 customers. Just like that, right? 16,000 customers, yeah. It's not that big of an attack, really, when you think about it. I mean, it's devastating. It's really what it is. The carriers looking at having a bunch of cameras running so much traffic over the intercontinental fiber links that they're starting to wonder, can we actually pass traffic from country to country, right? Some people are saying it was a terabit of bandwidth, right? Brian Krebs says it was a terabit of bandwidth. We only saw about 650 gigabits. That's all. The 650 gigabits, you know, it's, it's pretty good. You know, so then, the next iteration of this, of course, is BrickerBot, where we wrote some honeypots. My uh, coworker, Pascal, that covers the EU, uh, starts writing his own honeypot and starts seeing these weird commands come in and starts tracing it down. We go, okay, if the Mirai botnet is trying to spread, then, and it pings a device on a ubiquity antenna, it now jumps in, tries to brute force its way into the camera, gets root, overrides the whole file system, and then reboots so that the camera is completely dead. Right? It's called a permanent denial of service. And the, the janitor says, I'm doing the world a favor. I'm committing digital chemotherapy to the internet. 
He just attacked an ISP in India and took two million cable modems offline as a warning shot that you either fix your remote management and your cable modems or I'm going to destroy all the equipment on your network and all of your customers are going to go offline permanently. This is who the janitor is. This is, you know, these are the actors in the space and what the kinds of things that they're doing. So. Yeah, but the problem, the, pro the, 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 problem, the problem with bricking equipment and destroying people's personal property just because they may not necessarily have the wherewithal to patch their home equipment or to patch their camera or they bought from a manufacturer that's not patching their gear is what do you, what do, you do about Samsung? Right, 40 root vulnerabilities in their, in their operating system that goes across watches, tablets, TVs, smart TVs, everything else. And I don't want to pick on Samsung. They're, they're a, a wonderful technology company. People really enjoy their products, but there's vulnerabilities out there. You know? So you're like, what, are you going to stop at cameras? Why don't we go after TVs? Why don't we go after smart watches? Why don't we go after tablets? Why don't we go after the phones? Just like the new vulnerability that's going after phones today over Bluetooth. Right? All the Linux-based phones, the Microsoft-based phones, the only one that didn't get hit this time was the iPhone, right? Maybe it's, you know, maybe there's something there, maybe there's not, but, you know, these kinds of things are happening, right? Do you want the janitor to do digital chemotherapy on your $1,000 phone? I don't. I'd be mad, extremely mad, right? So one in seven of the companies that we've talked to that provide us with information said that they've had a ransom attack in the past year. In the U.S., they pay $7,500 to just go away, right? Do I want to risk the latency on my website? Do I want my e-commerce site slowing down? How much is that going to cost me? Or do I just pay a ransom? Do I just negotiate with these idiots and do I pay them? In the U.K., they pay about 22,000 pounds. In Asia Pacific, because of the blood in the water, they're paying 40, 50, 60,000 bucks in a crack. They don't even blink an eye, right? Do I want to be publicly embarrassed or do I pay? Right? Do you have the security controls in place? Right? This is the kind of marketplace where you know, the, the cyber attackers go, we don't even have to have any skill. They can just go into a dark net marketplace. Right? There's the Armada Collective who's been doing DDoS ransom letters for forever. And this is, this is some of their real emails sending to customers saying, you pay us. And there's another attack going on right now. We've uh, published an ERT alert about it, emergency response team alert. And it's uh, publicly available through our website. But you know, there's another group of people that are going out and they're sending hundreds of thousands of emails out there to go and go on a phishing expedition. These guys might not even be legit. But do you take the chance if they are? What does it look like if you have a large botnet attacking you and it's not going to be fun? So the shatter brokers, they're the ones that hacked the NSA's tools, you know, the, all their back doors and their toolkits, and they went out and tried to sell it for $572 million. Said, so you want all the NSA's toys? Here they are, $572 million. Now, no. You know, it had to have been bought by a state agency, right? Because I don't know too many criminals with that kind of dough laying around to buy hacking tools, right? I think they'd have retired by then. So no government stepped up and said they're going to buy the NSA's toolkit. So they decided to release it on the internet for free. And they did it in February. And as a result, they're now starting to offer it as a subscription service. If you want to pay for a monthly subscription service, you can start buying zero-day exploits into popular manufacturers' products and can start to wreak havoc on a monthly basis for fun and profit, right? So they do the leak. Forrester says that about $180 billion in loss to U.S. technology companies because of this. Now, think about this. In March, the exploits went out there. All the security companies took a look. They all said what they should have done. They said, we're going to patch things. We're even going to patch Windows XP. And we said, we're never, ever, ever promise. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I'm never patching Windows XP ever again. Right? And they did this years ago. Microsoft said, OK, we're going to patch Windows XP because of this vulnerability here. We're going to go back on what we said and the stand that we took. And we're going to patch Windows XP. Right? So WannaCry comes out a few months ago. Takes out 172 countries over 24 hours, just like that. Why? Because nobody patched. Right? It's, it's right to your point. Nobody patched. 
Have we changed? We haven't. So the funny thing is, is even after WannaCry, it goes all over the news, all over the media, everybody talks about it, uh, then the Linux flavor comes out a couple weeks later, and two of the 64 antivirus companies caught it in the first four days. Only two. I'm not going to name who they are, because that wouldn't be fair to say who's more awesome than the others. But only two of them caught it. But the thing is, is everybody could have patched. And this variation says, well, we'll just go ahead and we'll, we'll take over the eternal blue hole, and we'll just make all these Linux boxes um, Bitcoin miners. Instead of like spreading around and encrypting and doing ransom attacks, they'll just mine Bitcoin with all your CPU power. Yes? So I think a really great discussion among the three of us could be the, the kind of elephant in the room about this, right? Mm -hmm. So this is without question the FSB. Yes. And, 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 like, I wouldn't even say it's not a question. And, and I'm going to address this. I'm going to address this in a different way. And I'm going to talk about a paper that MIT and Capgemini put out in 2011 about digital transformation. If you haven't read the paper, I highly recommend it. Right? 69 percent of the C-level executives globally consider digital transformation crucial to their survival. What does that mean? How do you stop Amazon.com and Uber and JP Morgan Chase and some of these other people that have actually figured out how to automate and move faster and do things in a way that gives them a strategic advantage, right? Get the human out of the way. Get us out of the decision-making process. We'll make the decisions. And then we're going to move forward in a different direction. So there's a cyber attack marketplace out there. There's a DDoS coming, I can guarantee it. You guys know that guy from the commercial? It's an e-commerce site for criminals. It's found on Darknet. Most of the time, people are going out through Tor exit nodes and through relays. It's not necessarily you go get onto a web browser and you're going to get to Darknet. You've got to do a little more and use I2P or Tor or the Tor browser to get yourself out into Darknet to find these places. Most of the markets are available public. Some of them require you to commit a crime for membership. So they'll say, here's a vulnerable site. Go break in. We'll give you access because we know that you're a trusted criminal, or whatever their logic is for that. And of course, they use Bitcoin as their currency. So everything's accessible. It's easy to use. They do things as a service. Everything that you need is there, right? It's like going and signing up for Amazon EC2 for hosting. Super simple. So everything's fully available. Uh, there's a variety of marketplaces out there, Hell, Alpha Bay, Valhalla, Hansa. Now, granted, uh, Alpha Bay was just, the owner was just arrested in Bangkok uh, about a month ago. Uh, he churned about a billion dollars in Bitcoin doing money laundering, and uh, he used his Hotmail account tied to him. That's how they caught him. <laughs> And uh, he was going to be uh, brought back to the United States to face the same kind of penalties that the Dread Pirate Roberts got, which was life in prison. And uh, he was found dead in his jail cell the next day. So we, the taxpayers, don't have to pay for that. And it's, it is what it is. He's, he's no longer with us. But they captured the marketplaces. They've used it as a honeypot to figure out who's doing their drug dealing, credit card selling, uh, attacks on other people to try to capture and dragnet more people that are using these marketplaces. But some of these marketplaces, they're still there, right? I mean, this is, these are a couple of ads that you can see uh, right up there on the screen. So they've got services, the VDOS, Bank Stressor, Shenron. These are all DOS, DDoS botnets that people can rent. They have everything preloaded. Attack scripts, amplify lists, hijacking. They've got hacker forums, places where everybody goes and just talks about what they want to do. This is where the author of the Mirai botnet spent a bunch of his time perfecting how deadly to make that botnet, talking to other programmers. So how do they market their services? Stunt hacking, probably the best stunt hackers in my recent history, of the la or in the last 10 years that I've looked at, was the Lizard Squad. Sony Pictures gets hacked. They're releasing a movie that's offensive to North Korea. They wind up getting all their motion picture information stolen. They wind up losing a bunch of credit card information. And then there was death threats that if they released the movie on Christmas Day, they were going to blow up the theaters and do another Batman shooter. And Sony Pictures decided not to theatrically release the interview on Christmas Day. 
President Obama says, I really wish that you would have talked to me before bowing down to these people and you know that you wouldn't have done this. And so as a result, we helped do a digital release of it on Christmas Day. So it went out on YouTube, Amazon, Apple, a bunch of the other people so that they could actually let people buy the movie for three bucks and watch it. And on Christmas Day, what happened? Microsoft goes offline, Sony Pictures goes offline, PlayStation Network offline, Xbox Live ne Network offline. 18 seconds, crashed all their equipment. I have friends over there that have been kind enough to tell me exactly what, what went wrong. And essentially it was people's home cable modems that were conscripted onto a botnet that were launching DDoS attacks against these two companies. And up on Twitter pops the Lizard Squad. And all these little kids are like, you Lizard Squad guys, you're so mean, I can't play my games on Christmas. Right, because they wrecked Christmas for a bunch of little kids across the country. So everybody's talking to them on Twitter, and everybody's thinking, oh my God, is it North Korea? Even President Obama says, we're going to deal with them in our own time. We're going to retaliate in our own time and in our own place. So a couple weeks later, they pop up, and they actually start offering their botnet for rent. Everybody's like, oh, maybe this isn't a state-sponsored attack. It's a bunch of people that hijacked the news in an event to create an even bigger event for themselves and become a household name and everybody started to know who the Lizard Squad was. They made a bunch of money renting their botnet. They made a lot of money renting their botnet out. Can you say, say the address out loud? Just say it out loud. Say the address of the, their DDoS platform. Whether, say it out loud. I'll say it out loud. Go ahead. Stressor.ru. Yeah. Dot .ru. Dot .ru. Yeah. That's it. I'm a big fan of the FSB. Go way, way back. So, they advertise on social media. They let people know, hey, you want to become a big scary hacker and you want to go threaten people for money? Come rent the botnet. Right? They made over a million dollars renting their botnet. And the stunt hacking that they did made themselves a household name. They talk in the forums. They even give customer service. I mean, really good customer service from what we've seen. You know, people are very pleased with, I gave them some Bitcoin and they went and attacked and I had problems because I couldn't even figure out how to do half of this. And they walked them through it. They actually walk people through how to buy a Bitcoin and how to put it in a wallet and how to transfer it so that they can stop getting attacked. This is the level of professional service that these guys are offering in, in the darknet. So they do private offerings. It's super easy to use as a service, right? There's Lizard Squad's Botnet right there for rent, 1999, get you 1,200 seconds of DDoS, of extreme horsepower. They've been busted, right? And as you can see, there's their website address of where they were at, stressor.ru, the Shenron stressor. The VDOS crew, a couple of Israeli kids, they've been busted. 20 bucks would get you a 216 gigabit DDoS botnet available for rent, right? $20, you could prove that you are, uh, you know, a digital badass, you know, a hacker to be feared for only $20, and they go rent the botnet, they go attack somebody, and then they write them an email that says, you want, you want me to take you offline forever, or are you going to pay me the 40000 bucks? Right? This goes back to the 419, you owe me a beer. The African hacking scheme. <laughs> This, this goes back to the old days of like, you just get some kids and put them in an internet cafe and give them a little bit of you know, pocket change and now they can disrupt your business. They can make money doing it and they can scare the daylights out of people when they start to look and they go, who are these lizard squad people? Who are these attackers? Custom services, right? 0.35 bitcoins to hack an email. What would it look like if you had a political adversary and you wanted to hack into their email and you paid somebody just a fraction of a Bitcoin and then you dumped everything during the middle of their campaign? Do you think you could screw up an election? Right? When this advertisement was up there, that Bitcoin was a thousand bucks, right? For $350, do you think you could cause a bunch of damage for $350 hacking into email or paying somebody to do it? Jobs for hackers. So you say, I want to hire a hacker. Here's some of the bulletin boards of where people go to do this. This girl, Mia, she actually is like doing like the Craigslist in Darknet. She's like, I go to UC Davis and I need a grade change, right? 
She's like, I'll pay. I'll even give you tips, right? Here's my email address, you know? I'll do an escrow. I'll put some Bitcoin in escrow. And when you break into the university and you change my grade, this is where you're going to get your money. So it's everything that you need, right? It's totally available. It's so easy to use, customized solutions. DDoS is a service, botnet rental, right? 1.2 million devices, 115 gig gigabits, 0.12 bitcoins per hour to rent the botnet. Malware, they'll do a 50-50 split with you on malware. So they'll write the malware, command and control servers, they'll host it, they'll do everything that you need to do. You just have to be the one that pushes the button that's technically the illegal part. And they'll do a 50-50 split with you. It's everything that you need to become a criminal available right there at any point in time. They do hosting inside of their own forums. This is where people can pop up darknet marketplaces and you know, tumble a billion dollars in Bitcoin for money laundering. They'll do undisclosed exploits. They'll sell them to you for you know, a certain amount of money. Right Today, that would be about $50,000. When I took the slide, it was about $11,000. And of course, they'll uh, do leaked data. So this is the Mirai botnet. This is what the rental cost was for the Mirai botnet. 4,600 bucks for, you know, a week rent. These are free DDoS services that you can find on ClearNet. So if you, in case you want to actually just test your own defenses to see if you're ready for it, you can attack yourself. It's good pen testing strategy, right? Attack yourself. Break into your own infrastructure. I did a lot of red team work over the years, broken into a lot of places. I was principal architect, JP Morgan Chase, Washington Mutual, here in town. We used to break into stuff all the time to try to make the bank better, stronger, safer. Maybe this is where a free booter might actually be of value. Attack yourself Saturday night, 2 o'clock in the morning, during your outage window. See how you do. Visa MasterCards for sale on Darknet. $16, high limit credit card. Rent a hacker. This guy, he's like, basically he's like, I have no morals, I'll do anything to anybody. Uh, don't care, nobody's ever gonna find out. Let me know what you want me to do. Do you want me to destroy their company? He works cheap, what is it, 200 euro an hour? So taking a look at defenses, the reality check of this is that you know we're moving to the cloud, we've got things on premise, we have to think about our business, and then we have to account for people. And when we look at return, depending on who you talk to, what is that return on investment actually going to, to mean to them? You know, are you gonna talk to somebody about mathematics? Are you gonna talk to somebody about revenue per hour? Are you gonna talk about risk? Are you gonna talk about compliance? Are you gonna talk about penalties and fines? So this is where human beings tend to fail in manual signatures. I've got a problem. I'm going to try to go and figure it out. I'm going to go try to tune my equipment. I'm going to try to fly the jumbo jet that runs the security products in my infrastructure. And at best, I might get it done in 30 minutes. If you're using automation and you're using things that are doing machine learning, within seconds, it should know what's going on and it should be able to stop it. You have to move beyond this. You know, how much do you spend provisioning and over-provisioning your data centers for bad traffic? So, Henry Ford was a great man. He brought automobiles to us. And I'm not trying to compare him to hackers because they're criminals and they all belong in jail and hopefully more of us can do more work to, you know, stop that. But because they have more resources and more targets, you have to invest in automated adaptive security you have to take a look at how do I automate? How do I take multiple layers simultaneously and let the computer make the decision and get yourself out of the decision-making process? You have to decide to protect yourself and not look at a log file that says I have an incident and I have an incident and therefore I'm going to call my right hand man and then we're going to have a powwow in the meeting room real quick and then we're going to make a decision of what we're going to do on what piece of technology and where we're going to do it. No. Automate. Move towards automation. The MIT paper about digital transformation talks in great depth about it and if you want to be a digerati and compete in today's world, you have to move towards automation. So. Sometimes services are things that are going to really help you. If 
finding people that actually have a tremendous amount of talent can bring a lot of value to your organization. Make sure you have visibility, a lot of visibility. So if you're blind, if you don't know that you're being attacked, you're, you're not even in the game anymore. You're done. So every second counts. That's my presentation. I thank you guys so much for coming here tonight. Thank you, David. At this point, I'm going to ask these speakers to come sit over here in the chairs. And if anybody has a question, I'll ask you to make your way over to the microphone here. And we'll ask, we'll ask the audience, excuse me, the panelists. There is literally no possible way to make Equifax worse than it already is. Um, I, this is really your line. Uh, we are 50-something-year-old hackers. We're 50-somethings, 40-somethings. Uh, my first computer was a PDP J1184. My dad was a dad brought one home, Deco EM. So long time ago, long time ago. No. 1974 for me. 79, right? So Started writing viruses in the early 80s. Yeah. So here's the deal. Um, the mindset of the people managing uh, Equifax, your line, uh, these guys need to retire. The idea that you can't patch because patching could break production is a very vintage 1980s, 1990s concept. Uh, companies that develop patches are very good at ensuring that their patches don't make the cure worse than the disease. The argument that we cannot patch because if we patch, we'll break things, is put to lie by Facebook's motto. Does anybody know what Facebook's motto is? They have it written everywhere. It says, move fast and break things. That's Facebook's motto. Uh, Equifax's motto is, please God, don't make us patch. So uh, those people really did need to not retire. They needed to be fired. And, um, and the details are this. In March of last year, the Mozilla Foundation found a bug in a package called Struts. And Struts is a way to make web-based applications communicate better between the front end, the business logic, and the data in the back. That's what Struts does. Simplest explanation. Certain configuration files for Struts are based on XML. Certain Communications between struts layers are based on this XML programming, kind of this configuration language format. They had a format in it called command. Command. Command equals command. The parser would literally execute the command. That bug has existed for 11 years. Um, all of us in the security industry are humiliated that we didn't find such a cool and stupid, that would be great stunt hacking. Right? Bringing down every single Struts instance on the planet. Anyway. You called it a bug. It's a feature. It was a feature. You're exactly yeah, right. But, but admin admin for their South American uh, information was egregious. Can I? You know, go, it, goes beyond, it goes beyond I should have patched. Now, you know, the, the companies that I've seen do it very well have interesting strategies. Some of them do code review, and they make sure that they do everything from a secure programming perspective that wouldn't even require them to have a web application firewall. And then they have a web application firewall from somebody in the Gartner Leaders Quadrant, and then they have another web application firewall living on a span port 
that actually can write into an API that can start to shim into Akamai, which is a 150,000 node cache network globally, and they can just start to kick users out so they can't even enumerate more than one attack. They try one attack and they go, okay, that's it, we fingerprint you, you're just in the sin bin, bye. So if you try one attack, you don't get to try two attacks. You might use your whole 100,000 node botnet to try to go back and forth from attack to attack to attack until the whole botnet gets fingerprinted and then the whole botnet is just blocked globally, automatically. Dave Kulinane, who is the CISO of eBay, who's a friend of mine, said that we help them stop 60 million attacks per day. This is people that do it fairly well. Multiple layers of technology simultaneously. You know, it's not just a matter of getting a checkbox and say, I have PCI compliance. Ta-da! I've passed my audit this year. That doesn't mean anything. I, 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 I just want to dive in, dive in real quickly here. What Equifax had was a system of actually anti-resilience. What they had built was something that they felt so nervous about patching that they didn't do it. And the argument, if any of you are on IT, you've heard this argument a hundred times. Oh, no, no, we can't patch that. We can't, don't go poke at that. It might fall over dead. Well, they spent, they spent millions on their web application firewalls. Right. They just didn't use them. Yeah, they, so they, they produced something that was anti, essentially anti-resilient. You, you compare that to somebody like, and I'll use the example of Netflix. Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey is one of the most brilliant inventions I have ever heard of. If you've not ever Up heard of Simeon this. Simeon Army. Yeah, the, if you, the entire Simeon Army that they followed it with is interesting. The idea, if you haven't read about it before, is that you're all coding up Netflix and make it resilient, please. Oh, and you guys, you little group over here, you're coding up something that's gonna go internally and go attack all of the Netflix stuff. Try to break it. And that's all sanctioned. So all of you, all of the rest of you who are trying to make it resilient, you're up against these folks. You're up against math. <laughs> exactly. So you're up against math. So this is uh, Professor Ted Lewis's book. It's called Box Sand Pile. Uh, per Bach is a, a man who invented this concept of self-organizing criticalities. He teaches at MPS. And um, this should be required reading for anybody who wants to understand how things layer fragility to the point where you're like Equifax and you're so fragile and so unstable that the idea of patching struts is anathema to your dubious business plan at best. So. Well, and, and that's the thing is that now, now that this has happened, their decision to patch is going to be made for them. They will automatically patch. They will automatically start to put virtual patching in place, even if it breaks the infrastructure. Part of the value that people bring forth when they talk about, you know, we're going to bring you a positive security model, we're going to give you virtual patching, we're going to put things in line that may be using our intelligence, whether it's our big data intelligence, their big data intelligence platform, whoever it is that's gathering this information and crowdsourcing it around the world. We say, we know what things are happening. And the 50 times per week that we actually assign a patch, we'll just go ahead and write the rules for you. You know, you can call it a service if you want, but. And this is, and this is like hippie punching with Equifax, we should totally, we should really move off of this. Uh, they are so, the problem that Equifax claims to solve is actually solvable by means other than, Equ Equifax is asking to protect you, to give them money to protect you from the problem they created. This is, and, and it's not just Equifax, TransUnion is, is guilty of this as well. This idea of using an immutable, permanently, you know, permanent identifier for you as a human, and once that gets out, you, that is your authentication. This is broken. This is 1940s thinking. This is, operations research has solved this problem in the 1940s. Their business model is predicated on it. The, the concept of credit scores, I, 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 that's philosophy. We won't talk about yeah. that. So in, in India, yeah. 
Yeah. Would you mind if we moved on to the next question? Yeah, I, sure. It would be terrific. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Thanks a lot. I, I, want to, I want to build on the Equifax case a little bit. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, one of your comments was um, as the potential victims of attacks, our enterprises have to think very differently. We have to change our culture. Um, we have to become more proactive. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on maybe the way or one way to begin changing that culture is to change um, regulation um, of these enterprises that are potentially like Equifax um, causing these breaches and apparently suffering no consequences. Okay. Uh, these people have not been fired, they've not been prosecuted, and Equifax <laughs> is not suffering really at, at all. Um, I go back to the Ed Snowden breach. Um, the director of the NSA was given full retirement after Ed Snowden walked out with half of the secrets of the NSA. There are never any consequences. Admiral Rogers is still in charge. He is. But, yeah, but, it's, yeah. but the guy that was in charge at the time retired. You poked all three of the bears, so we're all probably going to win. <laughs> um, I, we've all, all of the three of us at least, have all been in this industry a long time. We've watched go, everything go from zero regulation to in some industries, very high degrees of regulation. Right. And I would challenge you to take a look at some of those highly regulated industries and show that regulation has had any positive effect in reducing their breach, in reducing the effects of breach, in reducing the impacts of what happens when they're breached. Um, I'll give them a little bit of a break here and say that while they were patching and doing better and maybe getting better because of regulation, the threat model increased exponentially. True, however, um, you know, I've written a lot about the High Tech Act, and I've talked a bit about it today. And uh, one of the things that we're really very engaged in, um, I live in New Delhi half the year, so uh, I spent a lot of time with the Indian government. Um, I spent a lot of time with Tech Mahindra and Tata and Cognizant and Wipro and you know, a number of these organizations that work across the European Union, and they work here in the United States. And GDPR is the European Union's answer to data protection and data privacy, and it goes into effect uh, May 25th, 2018. And it even goes to the point where it says that cookies and targeted advertising, people have to opt in, and that they're so serious about protecting the identity and information of European Union citizens that they say that there could be a 20 million euro fine for violations or 4% of your global gross profits, whichever is higher. And the United States Federal Trade Commission is going to be the enforcement for the European Union in enforcing GDPR. So if a $6 million fine to a children's hospital in Dallas isn't enough to shake your CISO and your CEO and say, hey, you might want to think about this, I think that potentially the first couple of years is going to be a slow start for GDPR, but there, I can tell you unequivocally from what I see from folks that are doing a lot of data processing They've already assigned DPOs in most of these tech companies in India, and they already are taking it very seriously because to look at international sanctions for violation or failure to pay the fines is something that is strongly being talked about in the legalese circles. And whether or not there's going to be, you know, whether it's a paper tiger or not, many don't want to take that risk. So, you know, this is one way that people are starting to say you are going to start to behave yourself as a security company or in your security practice, or there's going to be strong penalties. Allow me to whip this out. <laughs> Frank and Mike, I'll ask you to do it in about two minutes each to make sure we can get through the next questions. Oh, no worries. This is way, way better than two minutes. Um, there is no hope that that'll work. I, I mean, it'll try. It, they will try. They'll implement it. Uh, the benefit of being the CEO of a privately held corporation with a board of directors of friends and family is that I get to say exactly what I really feel. And exactly what I really- Your Plato. Yeah, yeah. Exactly what I really feel about this is, this will not change until cultural mores change. There, needs, there are certain mores that transcend cultures. They're universal. My favorite one is, you don't urinate in the well. That's a very, that one transcends all cultures, right? You don't take candy from strangers. That is a one that transits a lot of cultures. Until we get, you don't click on the link you don't know, and you don't run other people's code in your browser, until that is so ingrained in our culture, 
that it, it, it becomes second nature, a lot of problems are gonna exist. The vigilante aspect of what this is, is gonna start doing is it's gonna be bad. There's gonna be a janitor who's even more sociopathic than the janitor, and that's gonna be bad, right? The regulations that are in place right now that have worked a little bit, tell me when my two minutes is done. PCI has lowered the bar of knuckleheads. I can remember people running credit card processing out of their basement on a Linksys, clearing a million dollars worth of credit card transactions a month. Like the joker in his basement with an unpatched Linksys router, PCI made him go away. Um, writ large though, internationally, I don't know, man. The, the United Nations, you know, is not going to do this. Interpol is not really going to help us. Um, I think that we need a cultural shift. I'll pass it over to Mike. Actually, no, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll have one very, very brief comment. Actually, the way that is written is it's voluntary compliance. You do not have to comply. You can actually let them sue you directly. So with, the only way the FTC has jurisdiction over you is if you say you are GDPR compliant. If you don't say that, then it's a free-for-all in the international legal scene. It's, it's very weird. Yeah, there's debate on that one. Can I have anyone who wants to, move, to ask a question to move over to this side so I can get a sense of approximately how many questions we have? Excellent. All right, next question. <clears throat> Thank you all very much for your time. I'm going to ask you guys hopefully a very friendly question to all of you um, in light of this uh, wonderful universe that you've all painted for us. Help us understand, and our season theme here is press on. You know, we want to paint uh, a narrative that um, challenges of the world can be overcome. So as I'm sitting here looking at giants from Radware and Leviathan Security and critical infrastructure, prove to me, tout your business model, that you guys can stay ahead of these hackers. My company should invest in Radware. My company should be looking at what Leviathan is doing. Tell me it works. Tell me it can work. What does that machine learning look like? Can we stay ahead of this thing? It doesn't work. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll follow that up a little bit. In two minutes, please. For each of you. The, the answer is um, we've never in the history of humanity come up with protections that are 100% it doesn't happen. I showed a picture of a wall that was falling apart. It's a few thousand years old, somewhere in that range. Um, so no, nothing is 100% effective. I'll, I'll give, and in part of my two minutes, I'll say what you really need to do is fundamentals. Do fundamental security properly. Patch your stuff. Build things that are secure. Be careful about how you enact these things. Our company will help you find, actually our company is built around the premise that bad things will happen and will help you find it when it does and make it go away faster. It's not about making it all stop. That's not going to happen. So in 2012, DARPA came to us and said, uh, we would like to give you a challenge on a par with make an airplane that you can't see on radar. So the challenge was identify and report on the exploitation of unknown vulnerabilities in government networks. That's an impossible problem. That's what DARPA does. They hand you an impossible problem, they hope for the 80-20. What we did was we worked on the basic premise that failures of attacks are as interesting as real attacks and successful attacks. So what we do is we take attack failures at internet scale, we put them through an emulator, and we judge, without having virus you know, signatures, we use heuristics, if that attack was benign or malicious, we call that a black swan. A black swan event is very, very valuable to an infrastructure, an IT infrastructure, an IT enterprise. It tells them what they need to fix, it tells them they dodged a bullet, it tells them they might not have something exactly right in their network, and it tells them that something went wrong. And the reason that your toaster doesn't kill you 
and the reason that airplanes don't fall out of the sky on a regular basis is that UL understands every deadly failure mode a toaster has. And the NTSB, when a plane falls out of the sky, they rent a warehouse and they put it back together and they don't rest until they tell you why the plane fell out of the sky. What Leviathan does is we tell you why your software failed. Bugs in software are all security bugs. All bugs are security bugs. That's not my comment. That's this guy, Theo Durat. He's a pretty smart cat. OK, having said that, that's a black swan. There's gray swans. Something went wrong in your network, and it's just weird. Someone was torrenting in a dot .mil domain. That's weird. You're not allowed to torrent porn on a military base. That's a problem. We call that a gray swan, because that wasn't a failed attack. That was just a failure. The torrent client failed. Now that's a little piece of data. Then there are swans. A swan is just something went wrong. Something in your network went wrong. If you collect enough swans, you can answer this question. Is one given cohort of computers more likely to be successfully attacked than another given cohort of computers? And for those of you of an actuarial bent, that is the only mathematics available to us to make actuarial statements about who to insure and what risk to not insure, what risk to mitigate and what risk to bear. We have no rigor, right? Failure analysis at scale will improve software. It has demonstrably done so at Microsoft. So that's why you should invest in, we're not taking money. But if we were taking money, that's why you should invest in us. There are things to do that are novel. And we won that DARPA challenge. 30 guys in Seattle beat Lockheed Martin. So that's pretty good. So where I think that we're unique is that we do manage services for our offerings. We crunch about 500 terabytes of raw data from 15 million endpoints per year. We manage 65% of the world's stock exchanges, financial institutions. We're in seven out of 10 of the tier one backbone providers globally. Um, We've had a pretty good success in market penetration and we crowdsource our intelligence. Now, what that gives you is that if you wanted to, let's say, be PCI compliant and ISO 27017 compliant and a bunch of other compliance, we'll guarantee it. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a 100% chance that a zero day isn't going to come out and there may not be some pain somewhere, but at least you're not going to get the fines for being egregiously negligent. We're going to make sure that as zero days are found, that it gets patched. We patch over 500 times a week based on the data that we get. We get all the log file information from Cisco and Accenture and PNB Baribas. You know, a lot of people give us data. We're involved with CERT India. We're in front of the UID, which is the Adhar database in India, which is a, you know fairly substantial. It's biometric and social security numbers all put together, right? It's not just social security information. It's now biometrics, right? One of the largest PII databases in the world. People are very concerned about this. And the fact that they, if they want us to say, we guarantee that you're going to meet compliance, we are patching. And we're going to automatically patch. And we're going to send our intelligence into the platforms. And they will even patch your firewalls for you, even if it's not ours. These are the ways where you look at automation and moving forward with agility. Is it, is it a magic bullet? No, but it's certainly better than not patching. It's certainly better than I'm going to make a decision on whether or not I'm going to put security in place. Oh, there's this bad thing out there. Oh, WannaCry came out. Oh, have we patched WannaCry yet? Have we patched? Hey, well, let's talk, let's talk about WannaCry. Let's all talk, run around. Did we patch WannaCry? What are we going to do? Let's check our routers. Let, you know, you're not going to have that question anymore. Right? This is the point that you can get to, whether it's with us or whether it's somebody else. You know, There are plenty of other companies out there that do excellent security practices. And that's what really you should be doing, is using an excellent security practice and getting the human decision making out of the equation. Next question. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys to elaborate a little bit more about defense against DDoS attacks. Because I, mean, I don't have a lot of experience in this field beyond what I've learned here today and just reading some articles and stuff. But uh, it, it seems like a very different type of thing to defend against than like making yourself hack proof, you know? Like it's. 
Yeah. They're, they're overwhelming you. So like, what should like I you know I I I do have experience with not being able to play Xbox with my friends because they took that down. So like, what That's should right. Microsoft or Sony or you know these these different companies should do? What, what should they have done? What can they do to, to prevent things like DDoS attacks? Okay, so first, first and foremost, um, our hardware does 400 million packets per second of challenge on network, HTTP, DNS, and we can do it SSL asymmetrically patented. But beyond that, we have a 3.5 terabit scrubbing network globally so that we can actually announce people's IP addresses all over the world and start to pull it into our data centers like it's SuperNAP in Las Vegas or Switch, which is the biggest bandwidth aggregator in the world. So we can cross connect com companies like eBay and PayPal and folks like that and just go, oh, you're under attack, let's put a 160 gig sledgehammer in place. And then if it's even bigger than 160 gigs, then we'll go ahead and announce it globally. Akamai has standardized all of their data centers for network level DDoS on our hardware. So you could consume if you're a small user and you say, I just wanna have a website in AWS or uh, Microsoft Azure or in some cloud provider and I don't want my website going offline, you could sign up for a service that says, we'll front end you, we'll even help you become PCI compliant, we'll protect you, and in the event of an attack, don't even worry about it. But if you're flying your own ship and let's say you're a large financial institution, you could put our hardware in the top of rack that could do extremely high speed SSL where we don't look at your payload, that's part of the patent, and we can actually deal with SSL-based attacks and asymmetric SSL-based attacks, and we can go in and actually fingerprint users very quickly and then block them off of this infrastructure. There are other players that play in this space. Uh, Frost and Sullivan just awarded us as the best provider in the world for doing this, so we're kind of proud of that, but essentially you have to partner up with somebody that has a big monstrous scrubbing network and our 3.5 terabits is sitting on tier one transit backbone providers. We're not sitting on you know, subpar slower carriers. It's a very high speed environment and this is why we have enjoyed having the majority of the financial institutions and stock exchanges. Okay. That's how you deal with it. What's the technical? Or he yeah, no, finds I, them and punches them. Yeah, yeah. What's the technical level of folks in this audience? Is there a general sense that so that, every single thing he said is true, right? It is. But every single thing he said is part of an arms race, which is also true. So there are agreements between people who carry traffic. They're basically called peering agreements, basically. So I promise to peer your traffic if you're well behaved. I'm AT&T. I'll peer your traffic if, if you behave, et cetera. Um, there are hard power and soft power solutions to this problem. A hard power solution to this problem is to say that we can enforce peering agreements with the full might of the United States, which is an awesome and dangerous thing to do. But it could be done. We can enforce peering of traffic as a national interest. No one has ever said peering traffic is in the national, critical national interest in diplomatic speak of the United States government. The day you hear someone at the deputy or secretary of state level say these peering agreements are in our critical interest, you're gonna know that, can I curse? Shit just got real. Like, if you hear the Secretary of State say that, then it's real. Uh, until it becomes really real, there is every single solution he said works, but it will ultimately be an arms race. I'm actually talking to Paul Vixie next week, right? We're going to talk about fighting the long defeat. Like that's what we call it. We call it fighting the long defeat. So, and Paul Vixie basically is the guy who invented DNS, which translates all the numbers to dub dub dubs, right? Smart cat. Mike, did you want to weigh in quickly? We have one more question. Uh, very briefly, uh, since I don't really play in that space, the, the level that you guys do, the, the only way to not get shot is to not be there when the bullet arrives. And that is a lot of what you're talking about. Um, you, I, I can denial of service your driveway by calling 15 friends. It's just gonna happen unless you're able to scrape it off before it ever arrives. Those are the only 
and, and both of your strategies actually reflect that. Last question. Good evening, and thank you again for all uh, attending today. Um, my question is really around workforce training and some of the opportunities that might be available to those in the audience that might not be as technical, but they're interested in um, learning about getting into cybersecurity. So as part of MIT Enterprise Forum is trying to encourage people to get involved in these types of innovation, and as Ben had mentioned, to press on and, and you know figure out how do we address some of these challenges. And then, of course, being here at Seattle University, um, we're seeing today that you could be a music major and you know be in charge of some of these companies that are running these. So with that, I just want to get your advice on for anyone here in the audience or watching via live stream, what would you recommend in terms of you know the next step if they want to get you know take the path of getting into cybersecurity or you know working at companies like yours and you know to help address some of these things? What are we saying current? Current students at MIT or people in general? And just anyone in general, because you know, there's there's definitely uh, you know from what you've presented today, there seems to be a huge need for people to help mitigate some of these and to be able to respond to these. And are there enough people here in the U.S., North America, or elsewhere to help support some of these efforts? The board of directors of Google asked us to do a study on the scarcity of uh, computer security personnel. It's available. You could just search for it. And uh, we found that there's negative unemployment in the information security field. That means that there are people holding more than one job. Um, yeah, there's negative unemployment in, in information security. Um, the lack of trained professionals is gargantuan. It's growing yearly. Uh, starting salaries are six figures um, for children, kids coming out of college. In order to get a job in information security, I think you need to be, um, you should probably have a computer science degree. And I would want to do something about the music degree. The best hacker I've ever met, Peter Zadko, Mudge, um, has his PhD in music theory from the Berklee College of Music in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, he's one of the smartest human beings I've ever met. So I, I, I don't hold the music degree. And um, my last grade of formal education was ninth grade. Uh, in a Jesuit high school before Chase Manhattan Bank insisted my parents emancipate me so I could go write programs for them. So uh, don't, don't, don't buy too much with the cert. I know this is an MIT thing, but um, I think a background, a fundamental background in computer science helps. Well, a degree from MIT goes a long way. I got to tell you that. Yes. <laughs> People don't even think twice about hiring you. <laughs> um, you know, the, the thing is, is, there's a lot of people out there that are very talented and they have a passion for it. And if you develop a passion for it or even an interest in it, you can go and find things that are informative. And um, our authorship is at about a half a million uh, unique visitors per month at our blog. And we're not talking about our products. We're talking about real interesting things, whether it's blockchain or GDPR or, you know, ways of, of you know, looking at attacks and attack surfaces, you know, getting the education, whether it be free, whether it be through iTunes University uh, or through a university, showing a passion for it is usually what happens to help people out. Um, here in Seattle, Costco um, has a lot of people in their IT department that have been there for 25 years. They started at the warehouse stocking shelves and then they kind of moved up a little bit and they said, oh, you know, you kind of like computers. Well, you know, what do you want to do? There's organizations that will actually help and groom that in, in their people and try to maintain their people. I've seen some of the most loyal employees in the Northwest actually working at Costco here um, because they've got a talented group of people and they train their people and they care about them. Um, if you have the you know, the, the capability of working for a company that says, hey, I see something in you, you know, you want to learn about computers, I'll pay for your education. That's another way to go. It's a, it's a friendly and easy way to go. Uh, I know Nordstrom and a number of other organizations here in town really foster that kind of environment. And I think that's what companies need to do to be able to develop the talent that they're going to need for the future is to say, you know, who can we look at along our employees and say, hey, are you done being a bank teller, you know? What do you think about you know working on computers? We'll pay you more, right? Do their eyes light up or do they not light up? Right? It's pretty easy. Recruit from the inside. Uh, I, I can support that directly, actually. I, I'll, I'll say, and I'm going to mention another institution because I do the teaching for that institution. Um, 
I've had both Nordstrom and Costco employees take my class. Um, I've taught in f uh, three, now about to be four different master's programs at the University of Washington in cybersecurity, and more interestingly for this discussion, maybe a certificate program that's about a year long for professionals who are trying to make that bridge, who are trying to make that change from whatever it was they were doing into cybersecurity. Um, it's one of the most successful su uh, certificate programs that the University of Washington has ever produced. It's we, you know, the online version has had something like 80,000 views. We've done it for 14 years. We had to expand into two separate classes and so on and so forth. It's, it's very popular because of what you're talking about, because you know, growing that talent inside is the way. Um, I do want to go just a little bit down a path, though, of what it takes. And that is, and this is just my general opinion. I do a lecture that none of you are going to be subjected to today because it takes an hour. And the hour lecture is, here's every single thing that happens when you click on a link. It takes an hour. <laughs> and I do that in a lot of different venues. I do that in a venue where I'm trying to, to explain to people wanting to do information security, here's the realm of things you need to understand in order to even begin in information security. And it's not to scare folks off, because at the end of that lecture, a third of the audience is excited. Like, I didn't know all that. That's really cool. You know, about a third of that lecture is DNS. Yeah. Can I tell you what the Army's doing? We're bumping up on time. Could you do it in about 30 seconds? When I tell you the name, you're going to want me to describe it. It's called the Unicorn Farm, right? Because you can't breed unicorns, and they're magical, and you have to find them. So what the Army does is they have an, a completely comprehensive database of every single member of the armed forces. And they use that database to select people. And they give them, and you know who was instrumental in this? Jason Crabtree, a mutual friend. The unicorn farm is uh, in Georgia. And they find the unicorns, they bring them to Georgia, and they train them by the best people in the world. And they find them based on criteria that I probably shouldn't discuss, right? They have their own criteria. And it's, uh, it's a special thing. I think it could work for huge organizations. So a Boeing it might work for. Uh, it would maybe work for truly tremendous organizations to make their own unicorn farm, not unlike how you described Costco and Nordstrom. I just love the name. Um, well, this is a great discussion because, like I said at the beginning, uh, the main thing that we're trying to do here is educate and inspire people. And, uh, and if there are any resources that you guys have that you can pass off to us privately, we'd be happy to share them. Uh, we want to keep the conversation going. I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, points that, was, that were brought out tonight. So um, check out our social media channels. We're going to be keeping that going. Um, and I definitely want to highlight that digital transformation paper. I think that that would be, we'll particularly uh, tease that out. Um, as a thank you, uh, one of the ways that we thank all of our guests tonight, or our speakers, is a, is a subscription to Technology Review Magazine, one of the longest, uh, or I think the longest, uh, technology magazine in the US. Um, if anybody is interested in that or uh, attending any of the, um, the major events, like I said, our next event is going to be the Solving Future Challenges of Population Growth very non-digital, uh, so this is water crises, food crises, uh, you know, uh, uh, energy crises. Um, but M uh, MIT does two major events themselves, MIT Global, MTech, uh, Emerging Technology, and this happens in San Francisco and Cambridge. So uh, if anybody is interested in going to that, uh, please see us. We have uh, member discounts for that. Um, anyways, uh, that is it. Thank you guys for coming, and uh, please make sure to hit our next event.